Uh, it's a Australian ballot. All active registered voters were mailed their ballots. And you can contact the town clerk's office if you have any questions. Uh, please note that this meeting is being recorded. Anyone wishing to speak in person must come forward to the microphone at the center aisle. And we ask that you not touch the microphone. It um, creates a little bit of distortion for those people who are out in the virtual world. Uh, and actually some distortion for us as well. Uh, participants on Zoom should click on the raise hand button if they wish to speak and mute their microphone when not speaking. Online participants, please confirm that you can hear me by clicking on the raise your hand button. Okay. And I'm just going to text. They couldn't hear, but now they can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Great. Um, all participants must state their full name before addressing the assembly. <coughs> all questions and remarks must be addressed to the moderator. This is actually really important. You know, uh, these issues can be contentious. Um, it's important not to personalize them. Uh, so, to the extent that you can speak. To me, you can take out all your anger uh, on me. I'm used to it. I've done it for, you know, I've got kids, and so I'm really used to it. And I was in the legislature as speaker, and there was a lot of anger there. So, um, so, you're, uh, so if you can just um, please uh, constrain your remarks to um, the merits of the article, um, and then also just not engage in any personal attacks on members of the body. Um, I do know that you know we uh, we all received the um, reappraisal notice. Um, this is not a meeting about the reappraisal. Um, this is a meeting about the budget. So we'll, th there'll be opportunities to uh, grieve the reappraisal. And I just want to make sure those two things don't get um, conflated here tonight. Um, so in-person participants will be allowed to speak first, then Zoom participants. All participants will be allowed to speak twice on a given article for a maximum duration of two minutes each time. I do have a timer. Uh, or will I be doing the timing? You're doing the timing? I can do it. OK. Um, and, and I'll be, I, I'm not trying to be a jerk about it. Um, but what I have found is once you actually want, let one person have more time, everybody thinks that they should have more time and it gets a little bit out of control. So um, after you've spoken once on the article, you will not be recognized a second time during the discussion on that article um, until other, all other voters who wish to speak on the issue for the first time are given an opportunity to do so. Does anybody have any questions? OK. So the first question that we'll be discussing is, um, Shall uh, the voters authorize total fund expenditures for operating expenses of $9,419,728, of which $7,681,041 shall be raised by taxes, and $1,738,687 by non-tax revenues? So um, I don't know whether the board or uh, the town administrator uh, or anybody would like to preface um, anything before the discussion. Do you have anything? No, I don't think so. Okay. No. All right. Uh, okay, then we'll open it up to questions. Tony? Tony Coney, Cody Hill, where the taxes have doubled. I guess my question is, what's going to happen when the budget fails this time around? What's the plan? Thank you. <clears throat> um, so I think who, who would like to take that question about what the consequences of uh, a no vote are um, should that occur? I don't have an answer that uh, the inquiries that we have made through the uh, resources we have available tell us that we continue in force. We don't stay home. The workforce continues uh, with the town of Morristown. 
we have the authority to borrow monies uh, in order to pay expenses, which is a common practice whether the budget passes or not. It's, it is uh, the authority given the municipality. So we will continue to work. Uh, they will continue to mind expenses like we always do uh, until we can get a third budget proposal brought back in front of the taxpayers for their consideration. Anybody have any additional um, information to add to that? Okay. Uh, Got to give other people a, a chance. Uh, other questions? If there are no other questions, then Tony, you can ask another one. That'll be your second one. That's, that's it. I just want to know if this board and the town people are going to listen to the taxpayers. That's all. Thank you. I'd have to say that the, the board has listened to the people. The, the budget was around 28 point something percent when we first had put it out to a vote in March. It's currently 12.6, um, and then when you take the grand list into consideration, it's going to be below 10 percent. So I think that was a considerable uh, drop in the uh, tax rate or the taxes for the town. And I think we did an excellent job considering the economy considering how much prices have gone up due to the pandemic, stuff that was totally out of our control. Are there any other questions? Or input? If, if there aren't... I, I, might yeah. add, I might add one thing. Chris? Okay. The, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, I'm Kristen Fogdahl. I live in Jersey Way. Um, I don't, this has been, I think, covered to some degree, but I'm coming a little bit late to the process, and given the fact that this is a really important issue, I'm wondering if somebody could just give us the high-level summary of, um, in your analysis, when you, when you pulled the budget down, when you, when you went back to cut. Um, how did, did you look at opportunities to cut the most expensive areas like salaries, um, or were you focusing mostly on programs? Could you just walk us through um, the biggest areas that have gone up and why they are still so high, I guess is my, my basic question. Um, Could you be more specific on the areas that are high? Um, well, it, from scanning through it, it appears that um, salary is obviously, and that's often the case in, um, in an institution. Uh, it also looks like insurance, possibly, is one of the areas that, and so I think we would really like to know, or at least I would because I'm coming from the, to this question later, is um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of us would prefer to have seen it come down even more than it did. Um, and, uh, and so could you walk us through the, the parts of the budget that are still the most expensive and why that is the case? I would just say, I, I just want to say coming into it after the fact, although I did attend a lot of the meetings, yep. certainly how I started looking at the budget was, and how I look at any budget is, there are essentials and non-essentials, and there are a lot of contractual things that cannot be altered. Um, so that's how I started viewing it was, they may can be altered later, but for the immediate, and that really narrowed it down as to what we could actually touch at this given point in time. Um, you know, so that's, that's part of it is, What's going to happen in two or three years could be very different, but the immediate budget, again, some things we cannot touch for contractual reasons, lots of you know things, essential services. So, uh, 
So why things may seem high, there's also very likely a reason why we cannot, at this given point in time, can alter it. And so, you know, that makes it very difficult when you're trying to, because uh, budgets, you know, are projected out years and years and years, and it takes a long time. So all this, you know, this has been going on for several years. So that's, that's uh, how I viewed the budget and have <coughs> lots of thoughts for the next year and two years of where we need to work going forward. Um, but dealing with it right now, it's, our hands are really limited as to how much we can do. If I, if I could just add to that too. Um, I think it's safe to say that all five of us up here would have liked it to have gone down further. There's no doubt. Um, and there's no doubt that salaries and raises are a big part of this. And as Judy already said tonight, you know, we're living in a we're living in a time, certainly these last twelve months, where we've had inflation just driving so much of our lives. And I would say driving the lives of the people that work for this town as well. I mean, they also are paying the increased bills that the rest of us are paying. Now having said that, you know, we're bound by union contracts. We have a contract with our police. We have a contract with our highway department. And it's worth, no and, and those contracts have cost of living adjustments built into them. And there have been many years in the past where those cost, cost of living adjustments have meant very little to those individuals. Their, their raises have been minute. In, in fact, in some years, they've been zero. But, you know, we've, we've both, both the town, the select board, I wasn't on the select board then, but the select board in the town and those unions, you know, agreed to what they agreed to. We have non-union employees as well. Um, they see the same cost of living adjustment. That, and that's a policy that's been in place for over 10 years now. Um, and so we're just continuing that same policy. So it, it as, as Laura said there towards the end of, of her comments, our hands have been tied on a lot of this. And we're trying to fulfill services for this town. Morristown's, and I've said this in several meetings in the last six months, Morristown is not the small town that some of us might like to think it is. It's actually, <clears throat> frankly, it's in the top 10% of towns and towns and cities in Vermont. And there's a lot of services that have to be provided in this town. And, uh, you know, the 5,000 some odd residents in this town are responsible for those services. And clearly this board <coughs> has decided, the present board has decided not to cut those services, not to cut those employees. We can't cut their salaries. We can't cut their raises. Um, and we've decided not to eliminate positions. We did, we did, we didn't eliminate a position. We did, do, we did agree to not fund one highway position as part of bringing the budget down to less than 10%. We felt that was uh, felt that was responsible. As I look around the state and I look at other towns that have been in similar circumstances to to us, uh, I was reading in Vermont, uh, Vermont Digger this morning about Charlotte. Charlotte's in a very similar situation that we're in right now. We're not we're not unique. This is not a unique situation. Of course, the financial um, burdens that all these towns in Vermont have are very very similar, and. Uh, so I, I hope that answers at least part of your question. I was going to elaborate just on the health insurance aspect of that. Um, health insurance rates, you know, for 2023 would have been set back in November and December. So those those plans are already locked in for calendar year 23. Um, the budget we're voting on runs from July of 23 to June of 24. So half of that budget cycle, the health insurance premiums are already locked in. Um, so, you know, we are semi-restricted there, too, and what we can do in terms of insurance expenses. Um, and it's just it's unpredictable to, to <coughs> know or guess or assume what 2024 rates and options could look like. Chris, did you want to say 
No, I, I mean, I think that uh, both Don and Laura uh, spoke well uh, about uh, really what our fixed costs are uh, within the community. Um, the longevity plan for non-union employees has been in place since 2007. Um, and as it's been intimated, you know, <coughs> as uh, early as 2016, employees received a 0% COLA increase. Um, the COVID factor has played a role in everybody's lives uh, on all aspects. And um, when we put together this budget, um, we took a tremendous amount of testimony from the public. Um, we took a look at our fixed uh, costs and, and then figured out what else we could adjust to get us down to um, a discussed less than 10% increase in the overall budget. The highway department took a big hit. Um, you know, we eliminated almost $200,000 in paving. Um, you know, there was other aspects of, um, of the departments that we took a look at, but really the highway uh, was the, uh, took the biggest hit in terms of cuts overall. Um, but we're at $7.9 million service industry in this community. And the only thing that we have to offer are services. And the people who show up every day and night uh, to serve this community are the heart and lungs of what brings us all together. And so when you take a look at general government, you take a look at the police department, the highway department, you know, um, you know EMS, um, fire department, I mean, they all are people that um, come to work for us <coughs> and we have obligations to them. And, um, you know, out of respect, I mean, we have heard every meeting that we need to cut salaries. And we made it very clear on two aspects here. One is, and um, I believe that Paula, we, our human resources director, you know, did a deep dive into VLCT comparisons of municipalities our size and what wages were. Am I over my two minutes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you're responding, so. <laughs> but, um, you know, did a deep dive on comparisons of what we pay our employees. And I think systematically across the board, the police department was the, really the only department that we had that was basically parity of other communities, but in every other aspect, we were below what the going rate for municipal employees is, even with the COLA adjustment. And it's incredibly competitive out there when you have a fixed budget and you have no room to negotiate and you're competing against private sector uh, industries that can give sign-on bonuses and pay, what it, you know, pay employees whatever they need to get their jobs done, um, it's a fine line for municipalities all across the state to retain employees. And we're really fortunate to have the workforce that we have here. And, um, you know, I just think that as we've put this budget together, we've nibbled around all the edges we can nibble, um, but we've got services to provide, and this budget right now provides those services at a level that we think is necessary. I know that I talk a lot. I try not to talk. talk. I hope that's <laughs> Tom, yep. I can talk for 10 minutes. Huh? I don't know. Oh, no. my God. Just, just you ask it. questions, you got to. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I like to uh, respond to the, uh, to the fact that the, uh, the salary have been in place since 2008 or whatever it is. The longevity pay policy, which was initiated in November of, two, of 2022, which is just a few months ago, that is for the non-union workers. And that, uh, let me explain to you, the policy has eliminated the first five, five pay steps. So these non-union workers automatically get erased and then it decreased the retirement years from 30 to 25 years. And of course, that would add, and it also added pay raises of approximately 14%. Now that's a good pay raise for this year, and that's what's in this budget. The, the I want to go on, there's $3.46 million salary. That's what the salaries are for this town. That's 43% of the entire budget. It was not cut a cent, not a penny. EMS took a, a negative cut. The fire department took a negative cut, not a single cut for a single salary, wage, or benefit. And you think it's okay. 
and you took $240,000 out of the emergency fund and put it to lower to lower the, the tax the, the budget to 12.6. If you, that's our money that we have already paid in, we're going to pay taxes on it again. And if you hadn't done that, it would still be, budget would be at 16%. So there's a lot of work that's going to be done. And we'll see what happens come June 6th. Chef, I'd like to address a couple of pieces of information that were not factually presented. The first of all, the longevity pay policy was most recently updated in the November of 22. So that was an update to change language in it to make it more accurately reflect the, the, the current uh, wage scale for non-union employees. It was not created in November of 22. That longevity pay policy has been around since 2007-ish, somewhere in there. That uh, the language was uh, changed in that to reflect the changes made to the non-union wage scale. The, <coughs> the non-union wage scale was shortened to a 25-step plan. It had nothing to do with how long it takes for them to achieve a re full retirement. That is dictated by the Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement Plan. That plan for municipal employees is a 30-year plan. They have to work 30 years or contribute to the system for 30 years in order to receive a full pension. The shortening of the wage scale got them to the top of their wage scale such <coughs> that they would receive their, their retirements based on their high three-year average they would be at the top of their wage scale at the 25 year mark thereby allowing them if they chose to work the 28 years and take a two-year penalty if they wanted to retire at that point in time or work till their 30th year they would only receive a cost of living adjustment cpiw for the last five years that they're on the on the scale they would have reached the top <coughs> only the only increase they would get would be a cost of living adjustment which is not arguably potato towel it is not a pay raise. Cost of living adjustments keep the dollar spending at the same rate that it did the previous calendar year. That is CPIW. The raises our employees get, whether they're union or non-union, are step raises, which are the raises of one and a half, 1.5, 1 1.6, 1 uh, 1.7, I believe, for the employee <coughs> department. Those are their, their pay raises. That is, thank you for, for staying another year. We encourage you to stay because we, we appreciate the increase in your knowledge base you learned this last year. That is their pay raise. Cost of living adjustment is to help keep the dollar spending at a, at a, at a uh, continued rate from the previous year. It is also a means for us to keep our pay scales in a healthy, competitive market such that we are not every union contract every three years having to do a union negotiation over pay contract. Or, or pay wage so it has in many times the wages have not been part of union negotiations because there had not been a market fluctuation in in the pay for the police department we'll say only this last contract with them the first time and I think three contracts was the pay scale addressed because of the COVID impact and the lack of available people continues today in a grand way that the pay raises were the pay levels were adjusted to meet a market value we were six dollars behind in starting wage for our law enforcement officers it needed to be addressed in order to maintain the officers we had and to be able to be attractive to officers that are already fully trained from other agencies the reality of that is we save a boatload of money by hiring a current level three certified officer because we don't have to pay them to go to get the 16 weeks of training they come on board they get a fto field training with our uh, with our field training officers and they're out on the road it's a much faster turnover and it saves the taxpayers a lot of money the adjustments to pay that have been made have been made in order to retain the personnel we have i've said it before and i'll continue to say it i have a crackerjack team I have department heads that know their business to the point I don't worry about the day-to-day -day decision making. They know their job. Their jobs are specialty occupations. The finance director 
in a municipal government is a municipal financial manager. It is a different accounting than you'll find in many, many places. It is a specialty skill. And with that comes a rate of pay, reflective of that. And back to the point made previously in our comparisons, our current finance director, amongst many others in our employ, are paid below the average of their peers around the state. I hope I've addressed some of the misperceptions that were given to you because, anyway, I want facts to be out there. Tom, is this your second? This will be your second time? Is there, any, is there anybody else? Um, just, just, just uh, quick, Shep. Um, the changes to the pay scale, too, and correct me if I'm wrong here, those occurred effective July 22, and we're in the FY23 budget proposal. We, we are not proposing any changes of that nature in the FY24 budget proposal. Right. Is that accurate? That's correct. Yeah. We have someone. Yeah, you have someone. Yeah, and uh, someone here. Uh, <clears throat> James Brewster, uh, I'm just wondering, what are the length of the contracts? Three years. Always three years? Have, has a town ever thought of going to two years or five, or is there any thought process to either shrinking that or lengthening it, thinking of what the benefit might be? to I mean, one or the other. We could certainly explore that. Um, three years has kept us on rotation where the highway department is in one year, the police department is in a different year, so mm -hmm. we're not trying to do both at the same time. It's been three year contracts with the police department for over 20 years. Um, so again, not, not one of those things that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. It's, uh, it, we just haven't looked at it, Jamie, to see if there's a benefit financially in either direction. So. We can certainly look at that. And you're speaking yeah, union as opposed to non, our non-union folks are not on three-year contracts, are they? They are not. There's no yeah. contracts that are non-union. Thank you. Or, yeah. It's okay. just the distinction union, 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 union. Why aren't police fired within the same union? I mean, I work for the co-op, and we got line workers and we got office workers. We're all members of the same union. Yep. I mean, wouldn't that, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe there's benefit yeah. for you folks for being separate from the other, but wouldn't it benefit the town if you're just so negotiating with one union right. for all of your people? So the fire department is not union. The you're fire right. department is still a paid volunteer yeah. force. The only union we have represent our right. police department. Right, yeah, if I say yeah. fire department, yeah. It's okay. Road crew right. and, yeah. and, and it is the same union. The IBW, IBW. No, I understand it's IBW, yeah. but I mean, you have separate represent both unions. contracts with okay. two, why not? Just so that we oh. so that we can actually Understand. have clear so people can un, I, so you aren't talking over each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why don't you let him? Yeah, I can uh, add yeah. to right. that. So there, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, just that they're two different occupations completely. Uh, the skill sets needed for both are are that much different that to have <coughs> all of them in one the body of one contract. I don't know how we would do that. It would be a it would be a huge yep. document. It, uh, we we do a police contract, uh, a highway contract. Each of them have a u unique stipulations in them, unique unto the the job that they do. Where the police department uh, has a, a twelve hour rotation schedule in their contract. The highway department works eights in the winter and they work tens in the summer. Mm -hmm. And it, it, so those are those hours are outlined in both. I guess it could be meshed into one. I just think it would be entirely confusing mm -hmm. to be trying to negotiate a contract for two very different occupations into one document. So, yeah. So I have to. I, I have to sort of honor how I'm treating everybody the same. And so, like I, so once once we've cycled through, you'll get a, another shot at it. Yeah. Can I make a quick yeah. comment? Yeah. So just in regards to the length of the contract, having. Yeah. Negotiated many contracts between the teachers uh -huh. and the, the local school boards. I can tell you that I don't think either side, and my guess is the same as the tr true with the town and police and the town and highway in the past. I don't think either side ever comes in uh, hoping to have a contract of a of a certain length necessarily. Obviously, the longer the better because you get a little bit of stability. I mean, nobody wants to be coming back every year and re, re, renegotiating another contract. But it is just part of the negotiation process. The length of the the length of the contract is just one more give and take between the two sides. So, 
it really it really no, depends in the end on the entire package. So I would I would say there probably has been, as there has been with the teachers, there probably has been discussion of longer <coughs> contracts and probably I shorter ones. All right. Can, so I just want to yeah. I want to uh, sort of can I maintain? Yeah. Sorry. I belong to five um, theatrical unions that are national. Am I not correct in that the police unions and these unions are based off of national contracts? We don't are not national contracts, national um, unions, and you have regional dealings, but and my IBW is a national union. Yeah. They have a local office in Burlington. Yeah. Same office. And I have to say that industry standard is three years um, uh, for most unions. <clears throat> I don't know. Again, I have five unions, and none of us are two years. It's three years because the negotiating process is so tedious to get everybody to the table. So. So I see that Carly is. Oh, yeah, okay. Travis and then Carly and then. Uh, I just wanted to say that in terms of what employee classifications are in what unions, how we bargain, uh, that's a fine line for the town to even be talking about. We, you know, we, we shouldn't be giving the appearance that we're trying to sway the way employees bargain. Yeah. Um, it, it is very much up to the employees. If the, if the staff so saw fit to pursue combining unions, they could approach the VLRB and go down that path. That's not really anything the town can do. Yeah. Carly? Uh, okay. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know what next year is going to bring us, but I think as a town, we really need to think on ways to bring more money into the town. Um, I'm not sure how to do that, but maybe um, add a 1% to Airbnb, maybe do that and I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna word this right but uh, one percent to uh, meals and meal tax in town um, because I don't see this ever going lower ever it's not gonna go next year we're gonna have to buy something we're gonna have paving we're gonna have all kinds of things added to next year's budget so in order to fix this and maybe keep everybody happy we need to we need to bring more funds into this town. And if that's taxing things that I said, maybe that should be thought about. And if we already do tax them, maybe we ought to add another 1% to it. Um, but we do need to learn how to bring more money into this town. And I don't think the rec department's gonna do that much because I just read tonight on Front Porch Forum where a four half day soccer camp is almost $50 for a half a day. Um, I wouldn't be able to afford that to send my kid there for half a day for $50. So um, I don't know, maybe you need to get a group of people together with somebody on the select board and try to uh, figure out a way to bring more funds into the town. Thank you. Eric, if I may, just briefly, I will just explain that I agree with Kathy. I would love to discover more ways to bring more money into town without an issue. I would just explain, Kathy, that uh, the local option tax you're referring to uh, requires the town to have a charter. Uh, we Currently, the village has a charter. The town does not. Uh, the charter process uh, is lengthy, and there are uh, benefits and, uh, to it that are far-reaching beyond uh, a local option tax, but it is certainly something that could be discussed uh, at a committee level, perhaps, to investigate whether or not it's something that would benefit the town in the long run. Um, so I don't, I don't disagree with her wanting to bring money in. I would explain the soccer camp was something that the recreation program in Anna had uh, reached out to a club. It's a soccer club that puts this on. They have fees that they charge. Um, and Anna's not here right now. I don't have access to that. But I don't think the town is the one that's collecting the larger amount of the fees. If we have anything, it may be a $5 per day that comes, is it $15? So 15 of the 50 comes to the town of Morristown, the rest of it goes to the folks putting on the, the soccer camp. Okay. Are there, uh, are there others that'd like to speak? I know that Tom wanted to talk again, but are there others? Yeah, I want to talk. You got two. Yeah. Uh, 
Tom? We don't argue about the police uh, union. That was a very good de description of what's going on. Everybody's for the police union. We're for the police department. They have an increase in, in their budget, and nobody's ever said do anything with the police bu budget. And uh, what we're talking about here is what we can't control, and in my opinion, it is the non-union uh, wages that went up to <coughs> 10 percent. And you can argue all you want about what happened with the uh, the longevity pay. If you go on YouTube, 419 meeting, at about the hour, 45 minutes, you'll hear Mr. Dodge explain why they have to give uh, the, uh, the local non-union workers 14.3 or 14.4 raise. That's what we're talking about. How, how can we expect a 3,300 household in this town to pay for this budget that we think is too high. And if you don't cut somewhere on these high wages, we think are high, we're $5,300, $5,400, a year average. You're asking us to pay a lot of money. And inflation's hitting us too. And the state's gonna tax us more too. Everybody is. And you think this is low enough for it to pass. We'll see if it is. You haven't touched a thing and there's room for improvement. And when it comes back, we'll be here to discuss that. Thank you. Thanks. Any other, anybody else? Yes. <coughs> Hi, Christy Snip. I just wonder if you could address how much of the salary increases in the budget are coming from the union versus the non-union employees. I feel like there's a less non-union employees by a lot. Um, but it might be helpful since it seems like the the non-union employees are the ones being targeted here. I also just want to say thank you for getting the budget down to where you did. It was what you were asked to do. You did it. Um, nobody put a caveat in there about exactly what you needed to do in order to get the numbers down there. And now all of a sudden it seems like, you know, people are targeting it unless you decrease the non-union salaries. I don't think that's right. I wanted to just toss out there, and I think this is the number that we came up with, Tina, 3.7%. So the total pay raises for all municipal employees are resulting in a 3.7% increase to the budget. If we froze wages for everybody, we'd still have a 9-ish nine, nine percent budget increase. It's not a big figure. Um, I don't know offhand how many of our employees are union versus non-union. Half for forty percent. We have way more union than yeah. non-union. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you freeze. You know, if it's less than half, you freeze non-union salaries. What you knock two percent off? I'm, I'm going to make numbers up here, but ballpark. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. it, that's not a huge impact. The impact that would have on morale. The impact that would have on the town down the road. I've said this at past meetings. If we go through and freeze wages for only the non-union employees, what are they going to do? They're going to go unionize. And that's not for the best of the town. Uh, it's going to be bad for morale. It's going to cause turnover, which is expensive. I think it's a bad look. I think it's a bad idea. Um, I think there's a lot we can do proactively looking forward to talk about pay structures, compensation structures, and how the town wants to handle that. Um, I, I just don't know how much can be done right now on that. No one said freezing. I'm sorry, Jeff. Yeah. I, if, I mean, if you cut them in half, that if you cut non-union raises in half and don't touch the union, is it one one percent? We're knocking one percent off the budget with yeah. that. So, so maybe um, what would be helpful is we have the tool of front porch forum. If people uh, have asked about sort of the differential between um, union and non-union, if that's actually possible to get, I, you know, maybe. Um, because there is, there does appear to be some lack of clarity on this, um, and so it's always. I used to believe more information is always good. I still think it's mostly true. So, um, so. So I can talk to you. Why? More information. Yes, Chris. So, in a more global look here, uh, 
the idea between um, union and non-union is to make sure that across the board there's parity uh, paid to both the union and non-union. It would be, I think, uh, a huge deficit for the community to enter into an agreement, a contractual agreement with union employees uh, with the CPIW um, factor and then to, t to, to uh, say to non-union employees, well, you know, we're going to treat you differently because you're not union and therefore we're going to negotiate a different uh, pay for you. Well, what, what message does that send to anybody that's working for you? We made a commitment a long time ago, back in 2007, that says, you know, non-union employees are going to be, um, work under the same employment agreement as union uh, employees. And that was a commitment that stood for 16 years. And nobody said anything about it when it was 0%. Nobody said anything about it when it was 0.8%. And now um, the, the inflationary factor is what it is. And I can't imagine that any municipality worth its soul would go back on agreements made. And just as Travis has said, um, you know, as we look at negotiations coming up, as we take a look at the, the payroll, I mean, are there conversations to be had? Yes, and it needs to be a conversation that's thoughtful, fair and allows for retainage of employees so they feel every day they come to work valued. And when I hear these conversations saying, well, you need to cut uh, non-union wages, well, I would say to you, you don't value those employees very much. And I think that's offensive. So I think that we, we need to, yes. I'd like. Everybody should be a union employee, Chris. Uh, I, I, so I, I think. Everybody in the country ought to be a union employee, Chris. To, to, to the extent possible, if people can address the moderator. Yeah, I, yeah. I apologize. Yeah. Um, you know, it's been a long haul here uh, for both the public and the select board. Um, and uh, I think that we've reached a point where um, the board feels uh, very comfortable with what's being presented, um, including the payroll uh, factor. And I apologize. I shouldn't. Uh, I apologize to both you, uh, Tom, and to Tony. I shouldn't have reacted. Yeah, we're, we're apologizing. Well, I just you know. It's, it's, so, so, I think um, we have another question. Yeah. Uh, Carly, uh, Kathy, do you still have a? Do you have another question? I actually have somebody who's going to speak for the first time, and then I'll I can get you, Kathy. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so I guess my standards of proof are a little more stringent than for the for most people discussing most things and I've heard for the last month or two many assertions for which I've never really seen um, objective proof um, sometimes Arguments are distorted just slightly. Use of straw man arguments and so on. Uh, the 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 argument tends to. Can you look at me? I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just talking focus. to you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know all this already. <laughs> um, I love straw man. Uh, and and it's, the, the the arguments tend to wander in to the assertion that the no voters, who are becoming fairly well known are looking, for example, to cut services and cut salaries. And amongst the responsible comment commentators that I've read and heard, I've never seen that once. It's certainly not my argument. It's something that, as an employer, you would never do. Because taking away is, is, is felt much more strongly than not giving in the first place. It's merely an examination of rates of increase. For example, I'm hearing that a cost of living allowance is not a pay increase. All right, that's a, an economic philosophy debate that can be seriously had. 
amongst people that, that are very knowledgeable about this. I would say for the vast, vast proportion of wage earners in the United States, a cost of living increase would be felt very much as, 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 uh, as, as a wage increase. Uh, simply because they don't typically get them. So it depends on what you promise people over time, what they become used to. It is certainly true that taking away things, not, not even necessarily that people have already gotten, but believe that they are entitled to have gotten, is a morale buster. These are, so. So can you, it, it's. Can I, when, I can stand up later if you want. Two minutes. I, I, I'm, I've been enforcing the rule with everybody. I, I know. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, so. I mean, I can sit down and get up later. Yeah. You would can you do rather that. I did that? I, I would rather that you do it. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. I'll try to pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy? Okay. So what I'm hearing here tonight, I'm kind of disappointed in. So this is my... This is my take on this whole budget and how everybody is breaking down how the people that are opposed to it are um, making our town employees feel like they're not valued. That is not the case at all. Now, we could say that um, you're saying that we're not making them feel valid, but we could also say that you as a select board have put us in this position. So we could say we have a 50-50 problem here, but we need to figure out how to fix this problem. So just speaking with Eric and talking about the charter town, Eric apparently is not gonna be here. So I wanna hear from the five board members, unless he's changed his mind, Judy, I can see you smirking at me. Um, and um, I wanna hear from the five select board members that you will um, um, investigate this charter town. We need to do something. We need to bring more money in. I don't want this to just sit on the table and have this problem for the next three, four, five years. We need to figure this out. Chris can't sit there and blame us for this. It's not all our fault. So how are we going to fix this? You can't just keep blaming us and us blaming you. we got to find an area where we can bring more money into this town. So I would like to hear from the five select board members that they're gonna work on this charter town. Thanks, Kathy. I would, can I respond to that? Hmm? Can I respond to that? Uh, yeah, I think there was a request to hear as from the select board about thoughts about a charter as town. As much as I, I would argue the charter is not part of the budget talk, but I, I would just say, um, Kathy, I, 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 think we, I think we do need to have a discussion about bringing a charter into the town. I agree. I think, um, I think we need to get through the budget process first. This was, in large essence, the notion of the article in Vermont Digger this morning was the town of Charlotte is trying to get their budget passed and there's talk about bringing in a town manager at the same time and that they should hold off on the petition. I would hope the same would happen here in Morristown. We just need to get a budget passed. But once we get the budget passed, Kathy, I, I'm, I'm very much in favor of having a discussion about bringing a charter into town. It's probably long overdue. And then it would give us, and I just finished writing this down right before you started talking, right, right in front of me, but, um, I wrote down 1% local option tax next year with a big question mark on it. And it is a way to bring some money into the town. There's gonna to be a lot of discussion about that, but we do need a charter uh, for that. I believe that is correct. And it also, I w I, and I, again, this is not part of the budget talk tonight, but since you, you brought this up, I think we need to have a discussion about a town manager as well. I just kind of yeah, tied well, it. It's not part of the, the I just, okay. yes. Okay. Yeah, I think let the other so I just respond I'll, to that. Yeah, um, the other four. Sorry, okay. I, I did. I did actually sort of. Uh, I think it's fair to actually talk about the charter in a limited way to the extent that it was talking about um, potentials uh, for revenue that might, uh, you know, in the future. So there's some latitude there, but um, I don't think that it's helpful to have us sort of go off on that tangent in this particular moment. 
do you want us to respond? Hmm? Do you want the five of us to respond? I'm happy to respond um, I, I, quickly. Yeah, sure. I, I would just say um, that I, for the past three years, I've been looking into this, and actually it was a, a large part of my campaign, <clears throat> um, looking at other towns. There is a process, uh, as Eric mentioned, uh, getting the charter. Uh, we have some options, so I think the discussion's out there. Um, and then that will lead us to be able to do the option tax, um, the voting, um, so, you know, there, there's lots of things we can then do. Um, it's a step-by-step -step process. Um, and the issue right now, though, is that we have to get a budget passed in order to start the next steps. Um, but there are, and talking about a town manager, have already been started, so... Uh, we are with you, Kathy, on that. So, yep. I am. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll just say I agree with what Laura and Don have said. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I would concur as well. Okay. Yep. Yep. And I too. Okay. Jamie, and then you go next after that. Yeah. Yep. So I said previously that I would support this budget, and, and I still will. Um, you know, with the new appraisals that just came out. Um, and the, the 40 percent roughly increase uh, of my property value. Uh, I think I'm the town tax. You know, I'm looking at less than $100 increase in my town tax. However, what worries me is the education tax, and I don't quite understand personally how that's going to play into all this. And I can commend you folks for, pardon the pun, not throwing them on the bus. Um, but in future years, as a member of the public, I would find it helpful if there was a way for this body to get together with that body together in front of the public to explain how the two were tied together and how that all ends up on your tax bill in the end. I know, it's ugly. It's a nasty thing. And I can hear Bob saying, we got nothing to do with what they do over there. Well, I think the other thing, Jane, is that the formulation that goes into the building the tax the school tax is beyond my comprehension and many people in the I'm state the same, and they don't the even have that data until i don't know september july july or whatever but it, if there's any way huge. to help the public get a better understanding of how that one and this one are tied together because they both show up on our tax bill and like i said Right now, mine's going up based on this budget, less than $100. I have no idea what my education tax is going to be. And you're not alone. So it would, I think it would be helpful. I don't, I don't think it's fair for this board to just say to the public, well, it's not us. We can't help you with that. Go talk to the superintendent's office. Okay. I think that's yeah. a problem. Right. But we have someone yeah. possibly you, you can. Yep. <laughs> so shorter answer is a really I wish I had an answer. I don't have an answer. I've been on the phone with um, the superintendent's office. I've been on the phone with the director of finance for education for the state. I've been on the phone with um, our district advisor from the Department of Taxes saying I need an answer because everybody's coming to me and um, nobody will give me one. And they've told me not to give any answers, not to give out any guesstimates. It's kind of killing me because I'm not the type of person that doesn't like to have an answer. Um, but with the reappraisal and our CLA, they haven't set, um, they have tentative figures. The governor hasn't signed off on anything, so they won't provide me with anything. And um, then the reappraisal, because our CLA has been at 86%, we have been, um, last year we had to pay an additional 22 <coughs> cents for our education rate because of our low CLA. With the reappraisal, it goes to zero. So in essence, that 22 cents should in theory disappear, but they, they can't guarantee it. Um, so I'm really, really trying to get a guesstimate figure, but Okay. The director of education won't give me and I, my hands are tied. He'll pay us back in three years. Yeah. I mean, the state does play a pretty big factor in the setting of the education tax. It's not even just the school board. It is a very complex system. I, I'm not going to pretend to understand that I don't entirely. I think Elmore's CLA and uh, some info about Elmore plays a factor there too about who pays 
what aspects of the unified school budget. It's a really complex process. I wish I had an answer to you. I have no idea what the impact of the school tax is going to be. Okay. And then you're, you're next. Hi. Uh, so I'm just going to attempt to follow up on the question that I asked at the beginning um, by saying that what I think what I heard is that the budget remains at the level, well, it, remain, it has reached the level that it's at primarily because there are fixed contracts that you cannot get out of. Is that what you all would say and that that is, am I understanding that as well, Those are fixed costs in our budget. Yeah. I would so, say the majority of it is. There are some other things that the town um, wanted that are in there, but they're very minimal. Yeah. So then, however, at the same time, I'm also hearing things like a 14% increase. Um, and it's, it's hard because um, come June 6th, I as a voter have to decide, do I feel that this was done in a best process way uh, when I haven't seen the process? So I think what I would like to know is are there actually increases that are that skewed beyond um, uh, where most people are, I, I, most people I know are not getting 14% raises. Um, in this kind of economic condition. Uh, and so if there are 14% rates, and I'm just throwing that number out because that's what I've heard said, if they are in there, are, are you going through with them because you cannot get out of them? Um, or are there still places where there are um, very large percentage raises, raises that are more than sort of your normal person would receive this year that could have been cut. The 14 percent rate you heard was not from anybody at the board nor from our financial director. That came from the public. So that's a that's a, a, a well, topic, a, 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 a information that I would take exception with. And I'm wondering if I could ask the sure. financial director or Eric. I know Eric, you, you started talking about this before, and I'm wondering if you could reiterate because there was a, there was some there was some talk going on. I couldn't follow what you were saying. Well, specifically to the non-union employees, the, the longevity pay policy <coughs> is the agreement that the board set their policy. That's the one they are not willing to waiver on. That is the one that applies the CPIW and assures the employees of a, a one-step increase on their scale annually. And the percentage is? Well, the CPIW what changes is. For this, for the next upcoming budget year, yeah. their step raises at the uh, municipal offices are 1.6 percent. At the highway department, well, it's union, but 1.6 percent on the non-union wage scale. The steps are 1.6 percent increases. The CPIW is so I've got a seven. I kind of cut it off, but I think yeah, you, I, you can appreciate how it's it's really difficult to know what you're what you're voting on in terms of the facts. And I understand that you can't reveal contracts, you can't reveal private information, but I think, I, I honestly have no idea how I'm gonna vote on Tuesday because I don't know if a reasonable process has been followed. And that's a difficult position to be in as a, vote, as a voter. Um, I, it's hard to verify the facts and the numbers are very large. Um, and I work in organizations where people are not getting that kind of raise. And especially if it's going to, to impact people who might not be able to keep their homes, um, it's this really, really serious issue. And bottom line is, um, even if it's a, a negotiated contract that you can't get out of, if there are those kinds of out-of-line raises in them, they should not have been in there in the beginning. I know that's nothing that we can fix now retroactively, but I think what you're really hearing from voters is that going forward, we really want to know that best practices are being followed um, in our in our town because it's starting to have really, really large financial implications. 
Okay. Would you like a copy of the longevity? Mm -hmm. I, I think if I could just provide some clarity and please that correct, was the please, decision. Okay. Please, please correct me if I misspeak. The cost of living adjustment for July of 23 is 8.7%. The step increase for non-union employees is 1.6. So that would bring it to a total of a 10.3% increase for non-union employees, I believe. Um, so I, I'm not sure where the 14% figure is coming from. I think maybe that was the FY23 budget increase. I don't know that for sure, but my understanding is that for non-union employees, for FY24, for the current budget we're voting on, it's 10.3%. Right. That includes COLA and STEP. The budget that we are voting on has a 10%? 10 10.3% 10, 10 for non-union employees, with 87 being the cost of living adjustment and 1.6% being the STEP increase. Yes, I, I can say <clears throat> I, I don't have the data in front of me, but I know Paula did put a chart together. I'd have to dig through my files to find it. Um, the COLA has been between like zero and two percent for years and years and years. Um, this is unique, and I think we need to look at it. You know, I think we need to look at it going forward. I think we need to look at it as we bargain contracts. Do we do we tie directly to the CPI? Do we put a min and a max in there on the CPI to provide? more clarity, more stability, more financial predictability for staff and for the town. I think there's a lot of stuff we can look at. I think we need to look at it. Um, but as far as where we're at right now, it is a huge number. Um, but I, I think we need to honor it. <clears throat> and in most instances, other than with the non-union employees, we have to honor it. A uh, couple of weeks ago, I was thinking, you know, if I'm voting down a budget, I have to be doing more than just raving and ranting and saying no and complaining about things. I mean, we do have to keep the town operating. And it occurred to me to think, what would I have to see to vote yes? So I, I don't have, there's definitely not time to address it here. But I thought, let's get to an actual yes. First of all, the fact that your tax rate may not be going up that much is not a reason to sigh and say, OK, back to having fun, because the problem is not the dollar figure. I would have said yes to the 14% increase. My problem with the budget is the thinking behind it. Uh, first of all, there's the assumption that the town, municipalities in general, operate in some kind of economic environment that's totally alien to the environment, to the economics of the country in general. And that's just not true. OK, the rule, the, the, the behavioral economics of how employees look at their job, it's not different. Um, there was an, expect, uh, an inflationary expectation created in the last couple of years that I would like to see a real commitment, a binding commitment. I don't know how a select board works. To do that, I would need to see a binding commitment on the following year's procedures that would actually make this happen. What are the inflationary structures that have come upon us? Look at that and start unwinding. It's a multi-year process. Anything can be renegotiated. I certainly agree, let's finish the budget, let's get it done, and let's move on. But what does move on mean? It means for me, to see something where the select board obligates itself legally to take certain steps in terms of looking at unwinding <coughs> the inflationary structure that has it is now built into the budget. Here's a little tidbit: 8.7 percent uh, cost uh, inflation that creates that leads into an 8.7 cost of living allowance. It seems that on face value to be reasonable, except that the budget is a forward-looking document. That 8.7% 8 is already wrong. We are headed into a, we, inflation is now at 4 so, point something. It's probably going to get much less as we go on. So there's my list, a little bit of it. I guess what I'll do is write it down and publish the damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, distribute it, and you can see where I'm thinking. Okay. But I'm looking for not a dollar figure. That's going to change once the grievance. Wait till you see the grievance process. Yep. It's going to be. We're not here to talk about the grievance process. <laughs> I, I was really clear. No grievance process. I know. Okay. But 
Yeah. Wait to see how things change soon. Yeah. 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 I just want to say that um, I the 8.7% cost of living adjustment is a national adjustment. Everybody on Social Security got that this year. So if you take that out, it is a 1.6% increase for our non-union municipal employees. I think there's a lot being made of the 8.7% because it is a huge increase, but it's not a Morrisville, you know, it's not isolated to what we're doing in town. We didn't arbitrarily come up with that number. It's a national number. Thank you. Medicare, Social Security, recipients. So, um, I don't, any other hands? Seeing none, I am going to call this meeting to a close. But before I do so, I just want to remind everybody. What? Oh, that's the mouse. I think that's the mouse. That's me. That's the mouse. Sorry. Yeah. Hands are yellow. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so just a reminder, uh, this will be the uh, municipal uh, vote will be on Tuesday. The municipal building be open from 8 to 7, is that right? Um, and uh, you can also drop your ballots off at the drop box beforehand. Um, can we recommend drop box or in the office? Not the mail. Yeah, I, I would really encourage people not, <clears throat> I hate to say this, but don't use the mail. Um, it just, yeah. There's not enough time it's, it's not being delivered <laughs> fast. So anyway, um, uh, any, uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I actually don't think we have to do a motion to adjourn. You might want to mention um, also that the school wasn't mailed out so that everybody, you do have to come in to vote and it's not voting on the budget, they're voting on the merge, uh, release of the merger, that has to be done here. Just okay. Or, or, or call the request Okay. I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chef. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.